Good morning uh, in the United States. Good afternoon in the Middle East. My name is Danny Seabright. I'm the president of the US UAE Business Council. Welcome everyone to today's webinar with Her Excellency Sarah Al-Amiri, the UAE's Minister of State for Advanced Technologies on the Emirates Mars mission and the role of STEM and advancement of the UAE. We are so very pleased to be hosting Her Excellency for this webinar just over a week before the UAE's HOPE probe is set to enter Martian orbit. The AMAL, Al AMAL or HOPE orbiter was launched on 19 uh, July, 2020 and is expected to reach Martian orbit later this month. This mission design development and operations are led by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center and accomplished in partnership with Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado in Boulder with support from Arizona State University and the University of California at Berkeley. We congratulate Her Excellency and the UAE on all of the hard work as well as the vision have, that have led to this moment. I must say that the UAE is a leading voice in the modern Arab world today, helping to shape the region in new and positive directions. Indeed, the UAE's emphasis in developing a space program draws on the region's ancient traditions of being the cornerstone of modern math and science. The UAE continues to lead by example in setting a modern orientation, in creating a knowledge-based economy for the Middle East region that endeavors to push the region forward on a positive path and away from the roads that have led to strife and division in the past. The UAE has strived to do all of this in common purpose with other global leaders like the United States in ways that are aspirational and inspirational for future generations of youth. President John F. Kennedy held a similar vision for the United States in 1961 when he spoke about our country's nascent objectives in space as a unifying force and as an inspiration for generations of youth to come. Notably, I must say from my many years of direct experience in working with the UAE, that the UAE is humble enough and self-aware enough as a young nation in so many ways that it is understood from the beginning that it cannot make these strides alone and needs to do so in cooperation with partners. In my experience, the UAE strives to lead by example in this regard and not impose its leadership on others, understanding that creating positive role models for others to emulate if they so choose is perhaps one of the most powerful forms of leadership. Today, we are pleased to have over 300 registered guests for the webinar, comprising business executives, government officials, and thought leaders from the US, UAE, and the wider region. This includes friends and partners from the UAE Embassy in Washington, DC, and the UAE Consulate in New York, the US Embassy in Abu Dhabi, and the US Consulate General in Dubai, Expo 2020, NASA, the United Nations, five economic state development organizations in the states of Alabama, Florida, North Dakota, Texas, and Utah, uh, and our close friends and partners at the Arab Gulf States in Institute in Washington and the Middle East Institute in Washington. We have students, professors, and staff from universities, uh, a, a number of universities, including Harvard, Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, NYU Abu Dhabi, Khalifa University, and Zayed University, among many others. Finally, we also have members from the press from Smithsonian, Space.com, AFP, the National Arabian Business, and Aviation Week. I should note that this session is on the record and a video recording of this event will be posted on YouTube where we expect many more hundred people to watch in the coming days. Please use the chat function if you'd like to raise a question during the discussion. Her Excellency Sarah Alamiri, the UAE's Minister of State for Advanced Sciences, Chair of the UAE Space Agency and the United Arab, Arab Emirates Council of Scientists and Deputy Project Minister, Manager of the Emirates Mars Mission is one of those leaders who is a major voice in the UAE's efforts today in setting a new vision for the future and the region and quite frankly for the world. She is a tremendous symbol of the UAE's progress and ambition. And we are literally, Your Excellency, over the moon in our gratitude and having you with us today. 
Following brief opening remarks by Her Excellency, we will be joined in conversation by an incredibly special guest moderator, Matt Kaplan, who is the host and producer of the Planetary Society's public radio and podcast series, Planetary Radio. Matt will lead the discussion with Her Excellency on a number of topics related to the Mars mission, the importance of STEM, and of inspiring youth for the future. But first, Your Excellency Sarah Alamiri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Danny, for this introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to be here, especially sharing um, this session with Matt um, over space and exploration and the Emirates Mars mission. Um, on the 9th of February at roughly 7.30ish PM UAE time, uh, the Emirates Mars mission, the HOPE probe will start its most challenging phase of getting into orbit around Mars. What that means is 27 minutes of burning fuel, of using our thrusters off the spacecraft, undergoing one of the toughest challenges that it needs, that it's been designed for to enter into orbit around Mars. Uh, the speed of the spacecraft in space is roughly 121 kilometers an hour. It needs to reduce it significantly to 18,000 kilometers an hour. Um, the overall criticality of this phase is that we have no direct contact with the spacecraft. We only have intermittent one-way communication from the spacecraft telling us 10 minutes later what is happening with it during that time. This is a heavily rehearsed, designed, tested maneuver that has been tested when the spacecraft has been here on Earth and it has been tested uh, while the spacecraft was during its transition, but maybe something that's important to, to point out, although we've had a few trajectory correction maneuvers, we have never used our thrusters for 27 minutes continuously, where we're going to burn half of our fuel. We understood from the, from the first day of even working on this mission that the statistics were only half of those missions succeed in entering orbit around Mars. Uh, that was part of the risk profile of this project, and that was what was unique about the Emirates going into this venture and into this project, knowing that it is a risky venture and does not guarantee success. The underlying factors has been the development of capabilities within the country to design and develop complex technology systems, to develop a science team and, sci and provide opportunities and create opportunities for scientists to work on one, planetary exploration missions, but two, find a new area by which they can, they can impact within the country. Because what we are looking at down the line is a nation that needs to have parts of its economy and part of its industry deeply rooted in science and technology, be it in the utilization of technology or the development of technology. And that requires an entire generation who is able to work in both sectors, who, who are able to get know-how and experience within those sectors that today don't exist within the economy and be able to flourish and grow forward to ensure the sustainability and the agility of UAE's economy down the line so that we don't have any shocks that basically shake it, shake the economy overall. Space has been an area by which it has moved an entire generation. We see children today, we see college graduates today talking about possibilities of working in space talking about possibilities of being scientists, researchers, engineers, designers, developers, due to the fact that this mission existed when just a few years ago, under seven years ago, this was never a possibility. Uh, even if you ask the people on this mission who have been working in the space sector since 2006, they never thought that we would send a, a spacecraft to Mars or that we'll be able to expose to be exposed to such endeavors. Now, how are we able to do this? Our space program and one of the vital parts of it is an underlying factor of how are you able to build experience and develop capabilities and capacities in an area that you don't have within the country? And the, the one way to do it and the one model that we've, we've worked with since 2006 has been through know-how transfer programs with experienced companies and organizations around the world who have done this before where our team works within their teams and gains experience through that process. We were able to capitalize on that same model 
but a few years into it, so by 2014, we were able to start working with universities, uh, primary laboratory for atmospheric and space physics out of the University of Colorado Boulder, along with Arizona State University and the University of California, Berkeley, so that we're able to work with them on designing and developing this mission. And what it meant was that we were able to take experienced engineers from within our team who've been working for over seven years at that time on design and development of space systems to work with experienced engineers in areas that were that exist that on systems that existed for um, planetary exploration and didn't exist in earth observation satellites and with this amalgamation of one team which is the hope mars mission team that consisted of people from different backgrounds from different organizations that operated with this one single purpose and goal we work towards getting to the point that we're at today. The impact that we see today, we have an understanding on how to transfer capabilities into the, into the private space sector. And that within the UAE Space Agency allows us to further develop skills and capabilities to be able to establish a solid bedrock and also a solid, an, an, a solid ecosystem when it comes to the establishment of the space industry. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, very, very much appreciate the update. Very exciting. I'd like to turn it over to Matt now. And I just want to add, you know, Matt is the host and producer of the Planetary Society's public radio and podcast series, Planetary Radio. But his extensive background in journalism has ranged from public radio reporting covering political conventions to movie reviewer for an international magazine. He is incredibly uh, uh, gifted and versed in his work. And we're delighted to have someone with such a deep background to speak with you today uh, who has a knowledge of space and can moderate this discussion. Thank you so much, Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Danny. I am honored to be part of this. And Sarah, we've spoken before, but it is wonderful to actually be able to see you uh, as we anticipate this marvelous event, Mars orbital insertion uh, of hope. As you said, just eight days away, my goodness. I, I have talked to other people in your position. How does it feel? The question I think that we all dread. Um, comfortable and uncomfortable, worried and not worried. Uh, it, it's, my emotions are slightly confused at the moment, uh, but maybe to describe this to people, um, seven years worth of work of a team of amazing individuals from several continents um, rests on the fate of Mars orbit insertion, which is not an easy uh, maneuver. Uh, it's, it's hard and it's difficult and because We've never done this before, and this spacecraft is a completely new design because that was one of our requirements to ensure that it's a completely new design so the team is able to build capabilities. We don't know. <laughs> as much as we've tested this, as much as we've rehearsed it, as much as we've done all the necessary procedures, and as much as I'm comfortable that the team today did everything that they can humanly do to ensure that this is done, there is no guarantee. And, and perhaps that, that should explain maybe the emotions that a lot of the team members who have put their hearts, their souls, um, planetary exploration missions in particular are, is a human journey and it's a collaborative journey and it's a growth of the team. And the team is the reason for the success of such missions and getting to be able to deliver a spacecraft on time. And with having a very well-bonded team, which we've been really grateful to have, it, becomes even more difficult because you're really attached to this unit and really attached to the spacecraft. Um, and I, I wish I could explain my emotions, but maybe perhaps explain the thought process that we're all going through today, counting down the days and uh, to, to get around Mars. What you have just said uh, mirrors what I've heard from so many people who have faced this kind of, uh, these moments of tension as uh, their missions reach the, a climax like this. And as you pointed out, so many missions that have targeted Mars have not been successful. I mean, you know, I like to say space is hard, Mars is harder. Um, this was an audacious thing for the UAE to take on. It, it will put uh, the UAE in this very small club of, of uh, nations, of groups that have had a successful mission to Mars. 
Why Mars? You could have shot for the moon. It's a lot closer. Why take on this incredibly ambitious uh, effort? Because of the, the audacity that's uh, attached to it. Um, as a, perhaps going historically as a nation, we're 50 years old this year, by the end of this year, we went from a country 50 years ago in 1971 that had relatively very little infrastructure in, in place, very rudimentary access to clean water and even energy and power to where we are today. And the reason is we, we couldn't organically um, develop any sector. We couldn't go, if, for example, in the space sector to um, operate then Earth observation, then to the moon, then to Mars. It just, it wouldn't have worked um, to be able to develop the capabilities that we want to develop as a nation, um, to be able to, during the first decades, at least to two decades of this country, catching up with the rest of the world on, on, on basics and then being able to uh, move forward. Conventional way of doing it wouldn't have gotten us to where we are today. And I'd say it's the same with the space sector. Yes, the moon is hard, but if you're talking about developing capabilities to design and develop a complex system that needs to run um, relatively autonomously, that you have to take into consideration a lot of factors to be able to design and develop it, underscored with a shorter timeline, underscored with a shorter, a, 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 a relatively low budget in comparison to other missions. What it did is it made us extremely uncomfortable as a team. To, to just think of how you're going to design the spacecraft to lower the complexity, to lower the capabilities, to ensure that you have valid scientific data coming out of it. Because at this day and age, if you're sending a spacecraft with the technology capabilities that exist out there, you might as well get scientific data out of there instead of starting with a technology demonstrator and then moving up. Especially when we're talking about developing capabilities in science and developing capabilities in technology development. So yes, from a technical perspective, the moon is already hard, but if you're doing capability development, then let's maximize the challenges that the team goes through so you maximize the exposure. But from a scientific perspective, even Mars makes more sense to explore. Uh, and to understand, especially the more we want to understand climate change, the more we want to understand how other planets in our solar, solar system evolve, especially those that look like us. We cannot today send humans there. We cannot go further than, than our, uh, our own solar system to get a proper understanding of a planet. The only place that we're able to look perhaps, perhaps in, in some form of a future of Earth is, is our next door neighbor uh, that we can send robotic instrumentation too. So from a scientific perspective, Mars makes uh, even more sense. And if, if you'll humor this space geek for, uh, for another moment or two, uh, could you talk about the science that you hope, uh, hope will return back to us here on Earth? It, it's actually very important data. Yeah, so this mission will look at the planet and provide us a full understanding on the weather system on that planet. So that in itself is important data because other missions have been orbiting this, this planet from north to south. And that means that during one time of the day, one time of the night, one time of the day, one time of the night, we're covering the weather system. So imagine you're doing that here on Earth. One time of the day, one time of the night, sporadic locations across the planet. And then here you go, this is what the weather system on Earth is. I mean, we, you can step out of any other, any city that you're at and hour after hour, you'd need a new forecast. Um, and that being the fact, we needed to comprehensively understand the weather system of Mars. We do have gaps in our knowledge. We, for example, don't understand why there are global, why dust storms become global. What are the different factors that, 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 are, that play into uh, transforming such an, a phenomenon into a global uh, dust storm? And then what we're looking at is how far out hydrogen oxygen extends into, the, uh, uh, into space. And that gives us an indication of atmospheric loss. Now, what this mission is able to do, because we see, so we look at our weather system, we look at how far out hydrogen and oxygen extend. And by putting these two together, we're able to understand what role a dust storm, for example, can have in atmospheric loss. How much impact does it have? How does it change around, around that overall globe, around that planet? And we're able to cover from our unique orbit 
when we're very close to the planets, we're able to see a portion of the planets and study it comprehensively. When we get very far, we're able to see lots of portions of the planet during lots of times of the day. Uh, and that gives us our full coverage of, I want to know what's happening in Mars weather system everywhere on Mars during all times of the day. And I then want to understand how that weather system impacts my atmospheric loss. And if I go into larger scale of things, we want to know how Mars's atmosphere evolved historically. I know today we're able to study what's happening right now, what's happening throughout an entire year, but an understanding of the current dynamics allows scientists to look at implications towards what's happening to uh, the planet as a whole, what's happening to its atmosphere, what's happening to its climate. I think you made a reference earlier to understanding climate change on, on our own planet. Uh, and that takes us to why we study other worlds in part to learn about our own, right? Yes, absolutely. You, you, study, you study societies by understanding how societies interact and how they work together and how they think and, and, and how they operate. And that's what we've done historically. That's what we do today. Different groups of people, how they interact. Same thing with planets. Study the societies that exist around them, which are the planets within our solar system, which are other planets that are in other solar systems to know how they, they function. And as much as, let's say, uh, fundamental scientific research, such as what we're doing with the mission, seems today as something that is not directly linked with our needs today in various sectors, which are very important, especially during the time that we're going uh, on a pandemic on. But something that is important to highlight, science always has value down the line. If each of us throughout history, so each of humanity throughout history thought that scientific discovery, asking why, exploring, finding answers to questions that you don't even know what the answers are going to be. If those were inhibited, we wouldn't have the camera that, 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 is, that, that is capturing an image of all of us so that we can speak to each other. We wouldn't have the broadcast capability that exists within the internet that connects the world, especially during the time of the pandemic. And we all, I think as a generation, needs to, need to continue the development of science and ensure a balance across so many different um, areas and priorities and balance between what we need today and balance between the generation of new knowledge that fuels what we need tomorrow. So we've talked about the value of this mission entirely on its own, the scientific value. But so much of what this mission is about, as we talked about last summer, is so much more than that. And it strikes me that while we all hope and pray for a successful orbital insertion and a steady flow of data after that, in a sense, can't you say that because of what has already been accomplished with this, that this has been a successful mission, even at this point? Portions of the, uh, we, we've had very nice objectives now in retrospect, you can never declare mission success. So have you developed capabilities in technology and engineering? Yes. Science is very important and that's going to be ongoing over the course of the next two years. So for me to declare mission success is very hard to do because it's a continuous learning experience. It's a continuous mission. Um, space missions never, never end. <laughs> Especially if you're talking about exploration missions, it goes for years of design and development, then goes on for years of science. And you really do hope that the, that the spacecraft operates and behaves nominally, because you can even get more years of science out of that. So it's a never ending sort of uh, declaration of this is, so we're done, we're successful and so on. It's, it's a series of many worries and major worries and, and many celebrations and major celebrations. Well, fair enough. But I still think of, as a major goal of this mission, the inspiration that you are providing to the people of the UAE, the wider region, and especially to young people. I, I have a surprise for you. One of my colleagues at the Planetary Society uh, who uh, has an 11-year-old sister, much younger than her, named Anissa, 
who has mostly grown up in the UAE, and I'm told that she and her family are watching the webinar today. She wants to become a scientist. And isn't she a big part of why this mission is taking place? Yes, she is. And I, I, we're having less, we used to have amazing interaction prior to the pandemic um, with, a, with a lot of students across different, like one-on-one -on -one interaction, a lot of students in, from so many different backgrounds. But I can say from the children that are in, in my family, the people I socialize with very closely, considering the current state, I've seen a large interest in, in children, more awareness about um, space and understanding of what exists above them. And for me, what struck me is that they were, when, when Mars was a tiny little pink dot that was visible close to the moon, they were able to point it out. And, and know what it is and know that there's a spacecraft that, that somebody, they, at least from those, somebody they knew worked on them. And for me, that's, that's not a success, but that's something that I'm quite grateful for, uh, that, that, that I see children growing up in an environment where that is possible because it allows them to create so many new instances of what's possible down the line. And it stops the inhibition of, of uh, aspirations and goals and, and who they want to be and what are the possibilities that exist out there and reduces the confinement that we self-impose on ourselves and the biasness that we self-impose on, on younger generations and societies as a whole. Do you have anything to say specifically to Anissa and to other people of her age, aren't even teenagers yet, but are following this mission? So absolutely continue uh, following what you're quite passionate about I, as a person who is, I think, within their age, uh, at that time, I was fascinated with space, but I never thought that this was possible uh, for me to work on. Um, and even throughout the years, it, it became something that was on the back of my mind that, that I never dwelled on because it was never something that I considered that I can dwell on. So please do continue dwelling on whatever passionate area you have for, because I think this, this upcoming generation is able to create a lot of opportunities from the, for themselves rather than waiting for that to come, come to be. Speaking of youth, I, I remember thinking back last summer when I started to do my research uh, on the mission to prepare for my conversation with you and Amran Sharaf, the mission director, uh, seeing all these very young faces in the UAE who are a part of the mission team, engineers, other scientists like you, um, is, is it seems to me that there's a part of the message just in that as well, in this team that has come together uh, and all these fresh faces. So this region is made up of youth, people under the age of 35. And we as a nation believe in the importance of empowering those that are going to be custodians of what you're designing and developing today. The space sector is one of them. The space sector is something that's new. The space sector requires custodians of it for at least the next two decades to move with it. What better way to, to design such new sectors except, except with those that are going to be part of upkeeping it over the course of the next few decades and to ensure that it's followed through um, all the way till the end. And it's, it's about engaging all facets of society. If your society is made up largely uh, of people who are under 35, then your positions and your programs need to be made up of the same demographic that exists within the age groups of, of the nation. And this has been vital to this mission, but also has been vital with the way that governance happens uh, within the nation and the way that the programs are deployed overall. And without that sort of support, I wouldn't be where I am today. I, I wouldn't be working on such a mission. Um, I don't think such a mission would have been possible without that, that thought of how do I uplift an entire generation to be able to do things in a different way so that I expand the number of ways that you can get things done. I wanna mention that we do see your questions, excellent questions coming in in the uh, chat window uh, here in the webinar. And of, as you might imagine, we won't be able to get to a lot of them, but we are going to save a few minutes toward the end of our conversation uh, with Her Excellency today. 
uh, for some of these questions. And uh, we will apologize in advance for uh, the many great questions that we may not have time to get to. Um, here is one that I think a lot of people outside the UAE are curious about, and, and, and it's one that I'd like an update on, and that is, what's the reaction you're seeing from uh, the people of the Emirates uh, to, uh, to the mission, especially as it reaches this, this climax? Now, anyone that can get a hand of anyone that's working on the Mars mission, the first thing they ask is everything okay? Are we on track? Are you sure? Is there something you're not telling us? And this, this is a question <laughs> that myself and a lot of the team members are getting and we get a lot of assurance and to tell them that things are well, we've done everything that we can possibly do um, and things are going on track, but you're seeing a lot of excitement. There's a lot of billboards that started off today. The countdown officially started today. There's billboards everywhere. Um, talking about the Mars mission when it's arriving. Um, there is a general sense of excitement. Uh, people are really happy to see members of the team right now. And there is a lot of support. There is a lot of support. You, I randomly see people passing by saying good luck. We really hope that this goes well. And we are very proud of every individual that is working on this program. And, we, and, and I like that there is an understanding of the challenges that goes with exploration and an understanding of so how much exactly is the time delay to get to Earth? And, and for me, what's important is people are asking those scientific questions. Why does it take so long for radio waves to arrive to Earth? Um, and, and, and that gives you a facet to engage with the wider community, which science communication is a vital part of, of um, stimulating science and technology within, within, within a region. And just getting these very small pockets of information uh, of people just asking about the mission on transmission rates, why do you need to lower down your speed? They go online and they see us very close trailing Mars. Why aren't you entering into orbit when you're already close to the planet? There's a lot of scientific elements of this mission is triggering thought within societies and it's triggering thoughts with every single age group. And space missions are able to do that due to the fascination that is associated with that is a terrific lead in to this other element of the mission and why it was partly why it was taken on by the UAE, this inspirational portion of it and educational, which, of course, as the Minister for Advanced Sciences, and you are a science communicator yourself, you're proving that here. Um, the role of this mission in the ambitious, equally ambitious STEM goals of the UAE. And I wonder if you could start to talk about a little bit about that as which the HOPE mission is a component of, but it's, it's much broader than that. It's, it's, it's definitely much broader than that. Um, if I go back to, we want to diversify our economy, therefore you need to diversify your workforce, therefore you need to ensure equal interests in every single field that's out there and the creation of opportunities for every single field that's out there. And to be able to do that, STEM covers a large portion of that. I'm, I'm here perhaps speaking about STEM, but I never discredit the importance of every single field. At the end of the day, we work all together. There is no one field that can work in parallel, or sorry, can work in silos. Um, and the, the ability of this mission to move things, but more importantly, the ability of this mission to prove things with regards to how to, to get things done, be it to develop, how do you develop capacity? How is capacity development different than capability development? These are all aspects that, that, that were new to us, that we were able to experiment through this mission. How well versed is our current private sector in design and developing systems? And we've experimented with a few providers by which we provided them with contracts to develop something. And we were able to gauge how much experience they have and how to transfer experience into the private sector. And that, that continues to be a line that we are working on, especially now that I sit within the Ministry of Industry and Advanced Technology, which allows us to merge the two, the two together and look at the larger sp scope of the research development to commercialization continuum or spectrum and design the necessary policies and regulations around them so that you can create a more cohesive STEM ecosystem or science technology ecosystem and are, you're able to create that impact and that ability to create uh, new opportunities. What are the key areas of research and, and of technology expansion that uh, the UAE is prioritizing? So areas of technology expansion are two, is twofold for the country. 
One, it's a play on sectors by with which we are able to establish new technology dependence and space is actually one of them. And biotechnology is another one because healthcare is one of the vital, uh, vital research areas that we are, we as a nation have prioritized. We then go into particular sectors that exist today that we need to ensure uh, resilience is built into the system of development. So food systems is very important for us, especially that we live in an arid place that needs that we need to rethink the way we grow food and have better access to food um, uh, to food sources, especially gr grown food sources. We also look at water security because again, this is something that's vital. And we look at it from two perspectives. One from a scientific perspective for understanding our own groundwater and the ability to store water and extract it. And on the other hand, this, the, the aspect of how do you sustainably uh, get desalinated water from the sea uh, and you're able to build the necessary systems around that. Uh, and that goes on across our priority areas and also our science and technology areas. So metals is an important sector for us. The oil and gas sector remains an important sector for the country, ensuring that our research priorities are aligned with those important sectors. And at the same time that we, we continue to expand our overall scientific base because at the end of the day, yes, you do direct the scientific, the, the overall science and technology agenda, but at the same time, you need to have room, room for growth and room for creation of new um, areas and new facets by which you're able to explore new scientific endeavors. You and Danny Seabright both talked about the importance of the partnerships that you have forged uh, that have largely enabled this mission. And of course, the the US UAE Business uh, Council, that's uh, developing those partnerships is what the organization is all about, our, our hosts of this uh, conversation today. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, the importance of, of these partnerships, perhaps around the world, but especially with uh, agencies and others in the United States. So partnerships need to continuously become an intrinsic part of the space sector. Uh, for us, what where partnerships were important um, is being an, a new player in the space sector, a new player in exploration. We were able to do that in the six years that, that, we were, that, that we had to develop this mission. And it's through working with knowledge partners who have experience in doing this before and coupling it with our engineers who have experience in different types of programs. Um, so space exploration, just due to the nature of it being hard, remains an experience driven. You need to have done this so many times, made mistakes, and learned along the way for you to explore space successfully. And you have two choices as a nation. One, to go through that process of learning along the way of, uh, of circumventing challenges, or you can learn from other people's process because they've been part of that technology development uh, aspect. We are a global world after all, and build together upon that experience. And that adds addition, adds vital value to the overall system. If I talk about the Emirates Mars mission, the HOPE probe itself, as system design, it's considered a new, a new platform. The platform together with a launch and, and the instruments costs $200 million. That's a lot of money, but relatively speaking, it's much less compared to other missions. Instead of sending suites of instruments, we've sent three instruments, by, but innovated in our uh, orbit at a lower cost, of course, to be able to get the new science data that we were striving for. So the approach to designing a mission has been an additional add-on. If we did not go down the path of international collaboration, this new addition of how to explore Mars or other planets, how to design such missions, how to lower costs and complexity wouldn't have been on the table today. And that's why we need to correctly, I think, balance between cooperation doing things in-house, uh, collaborating with entities, and having teams deployed in different ways to be able to further the advent of space exploration. Uh, we've reached that point in the program, uh, Sarah, where I think we should turn to some of the many questions that are coming in. And I should say, as I review them, uh, there are as many statements of praise and uh, uh, gratitude as there are questions. So we thank you, of course, for all of these. But uh, here is one that uh, we probably would have been getting to regardless. And it comes from uh, Simon Curtis. Uh, to, uh, what is your vision 
and your future goals looking maybe three to five years out for the UAE space program. Where do we go after hope? Assuming, and I hope it's a safe bet, that this mission will be as, as successful as we all hope it will be. Um, interesting play on words. Uh, but so uh, two aspects is how we're evolving the space agency. The role stands as follows. One is to develop capabilities within the space industry, and that's the creation of new opportunities for, for the private sector, ensuring a lot of the knowledge that has been captured throughout the years and experiences, we're able to create opportunities for businesses to flourish, especially if we're talking about data analytics, access to space, which has become cheaper for smaller and smaller satellites that are able, able to do big, uh, better and better things today than they ever did before. And the other aspect of it is ensuring the right business environment exists and the right ecosystem, so the right academic and research environment exists around that and the existence of the right infrastructure in place to alleviate a lot of the overhead costs that comes into uh, working in the space sector. That is the next, the, the next sort of advent of the space sector in the UAE. The reason for that is the space sector can add on to our economy if we go down that path over the course of the next five years. And I also think of uh, the enormous role of space development much closer to home, low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, and the benefits that we already see it bringing to Earth. Many of these benefits have already been achieved by the UAE, I believe. Yes, um, we have worked as, as different entities that are parts of, of uh, either federal or the local government within the Emirates on designing and developing Earth observation satellites and spacecrafts and inventing into that. What I am interested to see is more and more small companies that are developing those spacecraft that are less bespoke than they were before, therefore lower cost of design and development, payloads that are able to collect various data sets, and more importantly, the utilization of a lot of the data sets that exist to create new products and services for, this, for, for, uh, for any end use. Uh, I truly hope that more and more, more people enter into this. There's a lot of products and services that come can, that can utilize just the amount of Earth observation data that exists today and can help in urban planning, can help in, help in um, farming, can help in so many different downstream utilizations that you don't even need to own a spacecraft, that you can start a space company in a room uh, and be able to, to do a lot of that analysis and, and deploy it when that was never possible before. You needed a large building to house a spacecraft, to design it from scratch, take years to do that so that you can develop a bespoke spacecraft to, to develop, to, to be able to capture a certain element within the Earth observation. Here's a question from, and apologies for my poor pronunciation, Sharif Mujabar. Uh, your Excellency, what was your personal, most, your personally most challenging uh, I, let me see if I can state this a little bit better. Your personal most uh, challenging effort during this project for you? I, I can't safely pinpoint one event that has been uh, challenging. It's been a series of challenges uh, along the way. It hasn't been an easy journey, but we knew that from the get-go that it's not going to be an easy journey. Uh, getting the spacecraft with all the challenges that goes into designing missions, getting the spacecraft on time to the launch site uh, was a very challenging endeavor overall from a technical perspective, from a non-technical perspective and throw into it a pandemic too. Um, and after launch during the last seven months, that entire journey, uh, perhaps a better question would be what is the, the high life challenge per week, but it's it, it's the nature of the business. It's, it's hard to do. It's really difficult. And, and we are all aware of, of that. As I hear from every uh, contributor to every mission that I've ever talked to. Um, here's a, a question from Noha Kandil. Uh, looking forward to collaborating further with Her Excellency on our Johnson & Johnson Women in STEM initiatives in the UAE. Uh, women in STEM, again, that's something that is fairly obvious when you look at the photos of the team uh, building the spacecraft and uh, staffing the, uh, the control room. Uh, women have played a very important part in this. Was that a conscious decision going for that diversity? No, it was not a conscious decision. I think it's a natural 
evolution when you have over 50% of your, today, over 50% of your STEM graduates and with that number increasing are women. Um, it was natural that seeing a generation where we're 34% women within this program um, is a, makes natural sense and it reflects the graduates during the time that, that everyone graduated and entered into this program. A lot of us started off on this program as fresh graduates and it's truly reflective of uh, the current state of uh, women's in normal inclusion into the workforce and normal inclusion into STEM. Even better that it wasn't a conscious decision, that it flowed uh, naturally out of the talent pool that, uh, that you had available, in my opinion. Um, here's a statement I said that we're getting so many of these statements of, that are really of praise, not questions specifically. But as an example, Maruf Raba, uh, to all panelists, well, that's to you, actually. What I see now is that all nations are working together as one nation for the for space exploration. And that is the hope, in all caps, for new generations. Thank you for this valuable webinar. I think that's representative of a lot of the other statements of praise that we're getting. And um, I think it's very much in step with what you were hoping to generate with this mission. It is a truly inclusive mission from the get-go. A lot of us on the team, when I talk about a common purpose, yes, our end goal was reaching Mars, but we all had a common purpose about the value of cooperation within humanity as a whole. And I think that drove us to amalgamate well as a team that come from two different cultures, two different countries, so many different backgrounds, so many different age groups um, that were able to come together on this one mission with a shared purpose of and shared values, if that makes any sense. And I think it's, it's, it's truly reflective of the work that we've done so far. I've worked with remarkable people that I've been very lucky if I was asked to design it, I couldn't have designed it better, uh, regardless of everything that we went through. And just knowing what our end, end goal was, especially when we started, the perception of the region, how youth were being used and radicalized within the region. That's when we started at, in 2014. This was the, the case within, within, within most of the countries in the region that were highly unstable. And people just wanted opportunities and wanted to, to be able to apply themselves positively for growth. And it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that we all work towards that common purpose and it's what we all truly believe in, which is the complete inclusion of everyone in, in the development process and in the overall goals of space. And this is what space is all about. It, it takes out of it the context of nationality background. You are, you become a species more than, more than anything else. We are nearing the end of uh, our time together. And I know that you have some closing comments before we uh, visit with uh, Danny Seabright again. Uh, Danny, will, who will uh, close this out for us, this uh, terrific hour. Uh, just a couple of other questions. Um, you mentioned we are reaching, we, are, we have reached the 50th anniversary of the founding of the UAE. And it is being celebrated, of course, with this golden jubilee. We also have Expo 2020 Dubai. Uh, it seems like a particularly auspicious time for uh, the UAE to be uh, attempting this, this very impressive achievement. It comes together with regards to what we want to achieve as a nation and embodies a lot of our objectives moving forward uh, as a country. Um, 2020 has given us a heightened even sense of awareness on what needs to happen. Uh, as much as the time has been challenging, as much as it has impacted health and our, and our families and those that are close loved ones around us, it has taught us as a nation how to be more resilient. It has experimented different things that are in place. And if anything, doing that prior to your 50th, when you're re-looking re at what direction you're going down in the nation building journey, um, it, several factors came together at the right time for us to look at our next 50 years as a nation. And what, is, what, what, we've, what we've experienced throughout the last 50 years, and I was talking to someone earlier today saying that it's really in one household you get stories. So for me, for my parents on how they lived in different cities and towns within the country in the 50s and 60s. 
and how I lived and how I grew up. And they're two stark upbringings. There, there, there is no way that you can say that, that we not only lived decades apart, but lived in two different countries and two different mm. uh, cities because the cities that my parents lived in, be it in, in Abu Dhabi or my mother in Sharjah, it's completely different than the cities of Abu Dhabi and Sharjah today. And the country and the, 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 at that time was not united, but the, rel the trucial emirates they lived in don't look like the, the United Arab Emirates that we live in today. And this is what you see in one household. And it's not a grandmother or a great grandmother telling her grandchildren or great grandchildren that story. It's parents talking about their upbringing just a few decades ago. But it's completely different than their children's upbringing. And this is something that I'm highly appreciative of what the country has gone through over the course of the last 50 years because it's been such a remarkable change. And, and I think everyone can go online somewhere and just compare images of the cities decade after decade. And you can see a stark difference every single decade down the line. It is so impressive to have seen this just in the photos that are available online. I hope to visit myself someday. I have just one more question for you. Where will you be in eight days on February 9th? Uh, during that uh, all-important burn that will uh, put hope into orbit above the red planet. With the team that I started this journey with. Excellent. Um, we want to get to your closing comments, but I, I do want to take this opportunity to, to uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, and all of you out there for joining us today. I, I know that everyone watching Certainly all the members of the Planetary Society that I represent and millions more around the world uh, wish you and the entire uh, Emirates Mars mission team the greatest of success. And I hope that you'll be back on Planetary Radio uh, before too long so that we can celebrate that excess that I, success that I anticipate and uh, the research, the science that will be flowing uh, from the HOPE mission. I also wanna express my gratitude again to the United States UAE uh, Business Council uh, for um, inviting me to participate in, in today's webinar. Uh, we will, by the way, Sarah, be celebrating your mission and the others that are about to reach Mars. As you know, there are three missions all arriving at Mars within about one week. Uh, we'll be doing that at our Planet Fest uh, celebration, Planet Fest 21 out of the Planetary Society. And if I could be excused for adding a plug, uh, planet, uh, it's planetary.org slash planetfest21 is where people can sign up and be a part of this celebration. And I look forward to rejoining your colleague, Amran Sharaf, who will be representing uh, the HOPE mission during one of the sessions uh, in that celebration. And I think uh, if you have some closing uh, remarks, uh, Sarah, this would be the right time for them. Thank you so much for hosting me. And thank you, Matt, for, for moderating this session. It's always interesting to speak to you. And I'm glad to be able to see you instead of a radio interview. Um, and it's uh, what's interesting, you mentioned something interesting where there's three spacecrafts arriving to Mars. I think for the first time, three spacecrafts from three different nations are arriving to Mars a couple of days apart. Uh, and that, for me, is, is remarkable to happen within this, within this country, with this, within, sorry, this time. Um, and I'm truly looking forward to the science that's coming out of this mission and to the images and the data products and what scientists will be able to find out. And thank you to the US and UAE Business Council for hosting us and for having us, uh, for, for hosting me together with, with Matt. I thoroughly enjoy our conversations. Thank you, Danny. Sarah, you're most welcome. And, and thank you. I, I and, and thank you, Matt, as well. I just have to say it's, you know, when you think about what 2021 is going to be uh, in the UAE in particular, around the world, of course, but in the UAE, the year of hope, the year of Expo 2020, the year of the Golden Jubilee of 50 years of the UAE as a country, it truly is an amazing year ahead for us. The cooperation that the new Biden team and the US is going to uh, endeavor and uh, undertake with the UAE on COVID, on vaccine, for the developed world on climate change with His Excellency Sultan al Jaber and uh, former Secretary Kerry. The opportunities to collaborate and work together are just immense over the next year. And uh, 
wow, uh, I'm sitting here thinking, do I and my team have a lot of work to do to try to keep up with you, Your Excellency, and, and try to do our part to support uh, what you're doing and the opportunities for collaboration and cooperation between our two countries. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, uh, for all that you do and best of wishes and best luck for the eight days ahead. We're all rooting for you. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening in the UAE and a wonderful day in the United States. Take care. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone.